Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this short lecture on Austrian literature. Um, before we start, I'd like to uh, thank the Austrian Cultural Forum, Cairo, for uh, the invitation and the support. Um, my name is Johanna Lienhardt. I currently teach German uh, language and Austrian literature at the uh, Masaryk University Brno um, in my position as ÖAD lecturer. Um, I specialize in Austrian literature with a focus on contemporary literature, um, as well as intermediality and cultural theory. Um, today, though, I'd like to put the focus on the history of Austrian literature and give you a short introduction. So what are the main developments, authors, books, and how are we discussing Austrian literature today? Um, if one begins to talk about Austrian literature, um, one question quickly pops up. Um, what is Austrian literature even supposed to be? And is it really different from German literature? The general assumption is this. Um, in Austria, people speak predominantly German, so Austrian literature is written um, in German. And so as a conclusion, um, it surely is part of German literature, right? Well, um, I'm not so convinced. Um, this idea stems from the 19th century, where literatures were defined by the languages they were written in. Um, but nowadays, nobody would assume that, for example, US American literature belongs to British literature just because they share a language. But um, curiously enough, this idea stuck regarding Austrian literature, probably because of Austria's geographical neighborhood to Germany and their closely intertwined um, history and school of thought. Um, but of course, Austrian literature is um, very independent from German literature. Um, it was met with different historical and sociological circumstances and therefore developed its very own characteristics. And what those are, we will see in this brief overview. Um, but before we'll come to that, um, I, uh, I'd like to point out two more things um, that often come up when talking of Austrian literature. Um, first is the question, what makes an author Austrian? This maybe sounds like a silly question, but due to the history of um, Austria, this is a question that is not easily answered. Um, let me give you an example for this. Um, Franz Kafka um, is famously known and often he is attributed to Austrian literature. But is he really an Austrian writer? Um, he wrote in German, but he was born and lived in Prague, which is today the Czech Republic. Um, but of course, back then, when Kafka lived, um, Prague was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Um, so the question is, is that enough to claim Kafka into Austrian national literature? That nowadays, of course, is defined by a very different nation. Or one might ask, is Kafka maybe a Czech author who happened to write in German? Um, the second point that is often made when talking about Austrian literature is that it is overly complicated, way too theoretically, as theoretical and basically unsellable. Um, we will see if we can rebut these cliches about Austrian literature. And at the end of this talk, I will circle back to that. Um, but first, let's see how Austrian literature developed in the last 120 years. Um, of course, we cannot cover all of these 120 years in our short time frame, um, which is why I like to focus on three important periods. Um, first, the so-called Kakanian, which means Austria when it was still part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire around 1900 up until the First World War. Second, I will draw some light on important literary developments in the Second Republic after the Second World War, and at last, I will talk about how Austria's accession to the European Union in 1995 changed its literature and how, as a result, Austrian literature looks like today. So let me share um, a presentation for this um, with you so you have something to look at as well. Okay, trust 
spotlight thread. So, and now we start with um, Kakanian, which we see here. Right. So, um, Kakanian is a term coined by Robert Musil, um, who is one of the most important Austrian authors. Um, and this ter term draws on Austria's union with Hungary in 1867, which resulted in the so-called K K Doppelmonarchie Österreich-Ungarn, um, which means the union between the Kingdom or Königreich of Hungary and the Empire or in German Kaiserreich of Austria. So we have a Königreich and a Kaiserreich, and there the two Ks stem from, which Musil morphed sarcastically into the term Kakanian. Here on the map, you see what um, the territory of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire looked like back then. You see here um, what is today Austria is this part. You see Vienna here. And here, for example, is Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, and so on. Right. Um, the atmosphere in the literary scene around 1900 um, was a pretty dire one. There was a general feeling that the end of the world was near. And in this case, um, this meant, of course, um, that the end of the empire was near. Um, but the result of this fin de siècle mood was not a stagnation, but a surprisingly vivid and rich cultural production, not only in literature, but in various fields of art. Um, here um, you see some um, examples for this. Um, when talking about this time, um, you might think about Gustav Klimt, um, a, a painter, um, and his famous painting, Der Kuss, The Kiss. Or you might think about the composer, Arnold Schoenberg, um, who was very influential with his 12-tone uh, music. And on the bottom, you see the architect, Adolf Loos. So those um, artists are examples for um, very influential um, art forms and innovations at the time. Um, this uh, period of doomsday um, that was felt back then um, was also mixed with a joyous celebration of life that later was described as dancing on a volcano. And today this is called the Wiener Moderne or Viennese Modern Age. Um, in literature, um, this term draws mostly um, on Jung Wien or Young Vienna, um, which was a loosely connected group of writers like Arthur Schnitzler, whom we have here on the left side, who was a, a prolific theater author um, and who was also the first author to, to use the technique of the inner monologue in uh, German speaking literature um, in his story, um, Leutnant Gustl, um, that you see here on the uh, right side. Um, then another example of this would be uh, Felix Salten, who you might know uh, from his um, from his uh, from the Disney adaptation of his novel Bambi. Or another example would be, um, of course, Hugo von Hoffmannsthal. Oh, sorry. So um, Hoffmannsthal published in published in 1902 one of the key texts for literary modernism called Ein Brief, um, which is usually called the Chandis letter. And in this text, the fictitious author, Lord Chandis, writes a letter about his writing and language crisis. Um, he feels he can no longer depict the world and his thoughts in language. Um, words he describes famously, zerfielen um, mir im Mund wie modrige Pilze or in English, um, these terms crumbled in my mouth like moldy fungi. This text has been read autobiographical since Hoffmannsthal himself was dealing with this kind of crisis at the time. Um, but at the same time, the text mirrors a feeling that was very common in European literature at the time. Also this critical view about what language can or cannot do, or what an author can do with language or cannot do with language, um, is subsumed in the term Sprachkritik or language critique, and is a thought that will be crucial for Austrian literature in the future. 
um, we will come back to it um, frequently. Um, yes, as you can see, the term Young Vienna describes very different authors, um, which is also typical for a time where a, lot, where a lot of different literary styles and ideas coexisted. Some of the authors at the time were, for example, interested in the fantastic, others were interested in expressionism, and still others um, were, in contrast, more conservative and tried to revive what they saw as the glorious past of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Um, Jung Wien or Young Vienna is also known as the Café House Literaten or Coffee House Authors. Um, here in this picture, you can see one of the most famous Viennese coffee houses, the Café Central. Um, authors at the time um, were often financially struggling, so they met in the big Viennese coffee houses and used them as a kind of public living room. Um, there they read the, they provided newspapers for free. Um, in winter, they came to the coffee houses for the heating, yeah, so they didn't have to pay um, heat, in, pay to heat their apartments or rooms. And so they, of course, also worked there. Um, but the coffee houses were um, not only a place to work, but they were also an important social space where you could discuss issues with like-minded people, um, think about plans and projects, and of course, also a place where you had an opportunity to meet influential people and network. All right, so now, before we jump in time and focus on uh, post-World War II literature, I'd like to come back to Robert Musil, um, who, if you remember, coined the term Kakanian. Um, I come back to Robert Musil um, because he grew to be one of the most important Austrian writers of the 20th century. Um, his novel, The Man Without Qualities, or The Mann ohne Eigenschaften, um, is considered to be one of the most influential novels of literary modernism um, worldwide. Um, the plot of this uh, three volume unfinished novel is really too complicated to retell here, um, but um, it is important to know that it can, on the one hand, be read um, as a satirical retrospect of the last days of the um, empire, um, and on the other hand, the novel um, is considered to be groundbreaking in the way a novel is constructed and narrated. So. Let's um, move on now to the Second Republic. Mm. After the Second World War, Austria became an independent state again. Um, and this state was called the Second Republic. Here on this map, you can see what Austria um, looked like after the war and how it looks, um, looks like until today. So this is the territory of modern Austria. Um, in the early years of the Second Republic, in the 50s, a group of young authors stirred up the Austrian literary scene, the Wiener Gruppe or Vienna Group. Um, this group mainly consisted of these authors you see here, um, which are H.C. Artmann, Konrad Bayer, Friedrich Achleitner, Gerhard Rühm and Oswald Wiener. They were interested in the literary avant-garde and Dadaism, and saw language and literature as a field of experiment. Um, with the provocative theater plays, which today probably would, call, would be called performances, um, but also with other texts, they shook up the literary establishment. In the tradition of Sprachkritik, um, they thought of language as material um, that could be used in different ways than literature did before. Um, for example, with Lautgedichten, or sound poems, or also with visual poets, poems. Um, here you have one example um, for a visual poem by Gerhard Rühm. Um, here he aims to show the content of the poem um, in its form. Yeah? Language itself becomes the topic of the poem. Um, here you see the word und, uh, which means and and which is a connector 
and which here um, like literally connects the words together um, up until the last line where um, it changes to the word zerbrechen, which means breaking and um, which is literally broken. Um, so this is an example for a, um, a visual poem, a visual poetry. Um, and here we have an example for a sound poem. And this um, author here is of course Ernst Jandl, who was loosely connected to the group and um, became one of the most important experimental um, poets from the 50s onwards. Uh, like the Vienna group, he experimented with language, um, especially with its acoustic and rhythmic form. Um, but his texts were not only concerned with language, with experiments, but also with the political dimension of literature. Um, for example, in this, um, in this poem we have here, um, which is called Schützengrum, um, which is a um, which is a poetic transformation of the word Schützengraben, um, which means trenches. Um, this is an anti-war poem, and here he breaks um, the word down to its acoustic dimension um, and evokes shots and grenades and explosions um, through sound. As well as at the end, in the last line, you see the T, um, the T sounds, which evoke the word tot or dead. Um, Yes, what I um, uh, mean with that, we will um, see um, with a um, recording of the author himself who reads this um, short poem, so we can understand its acoustic dimension. Here I started, one moment. <laughs> Um, what Jandl tries to say here is that the gruesome experience of war cannot be communicated through the beautiful, the aesthetically pleasing. A, a poem about war can and should not be beautiful. So let's come to uh, the next examples, um, because, of course, um, literature after the war in Austria was not only concerned with language experiments, but also with Austria's role during the Second World War and the years of Nazi regime. Um, starting from the 50s and 60s, authors started to process the experiences and crimes of the war. Um, they also called out the general public and politics who did not, so many authors felt, address Austria's role in the war and their own part in it. Um, two early examples of this are um, these two novels you see here, uh, these two texts. Um, on the left side, we have Ilse Eichinger's a novel, Die größere Hoffnung, The Greater Hope. And on the right side, we have Ingeborg Bachmann's das 30. Jahr, the 30th year. Um, the Greater Hope um, tells of a young girl that is persecuted by the Nazis and dies at the end of the war. Um, this novel is not only very well known for its early preoccupation with life under Nazi regime, but it is also celebrated for its style that is not realistic, but has surrealistic elements that make the account of the girl or the more, all the more gruesome. Um, another example is, like I said, the 30th year. Um, in this collection of short stories, Bachmann writes about how Austria's part and guilt in the Second World War is not dealt with 
in the public um, in the public discussion and how victims and culprits are forced to live side by side without the roads ever being addressed. Um, Bachmann also um, speaks from a decidedly female perspective, something, something that is typical also for her other um, texts. Um, for example, her famous Todesarten trilogy, um, the trilogies, trilogy of ways to die. Um, this um, topic brings us to our next author, um, the connection between a patriarchal society and Austria's Nazi past is something that is that also plays a crucial role in many texts um, of Nobel Prize laureate Elfriede Jelinek, um, whom you see here. Uh, Jelinek's texts often deal with the role women play in society and how this is mirrored in everyday language. Um, and in this, Jelinek too stands in the tradition of Sprachkritik. Mm. On the left side here, you see the cover of Jelinek's Opus Magnum, um, The Children of the Dead, um, or The Kinder der Toten. And in this novel, the dead come back to life in the Austrian countryside. Um, yes, so what sounds like a zombie novel is in fact a very thorough um, reflection on the question of memory, um, Austria's national socialist past, and how it lives on in Austria today. Um, the undead in this novel provide a picture for the past that comes back to haunt the present. Uh, so, um, this um, Jelinek is famous for her critical view of Austria, and um, this is also something that can be found in many texts in Austrian literature from the 60s onwards. Mm especially um, in the genre of the Anti-Heimat-Roman, the anti-homeland novel, you might translate it, um, you can find this. Um, this genre um, draws on the Heimat-Roman or homeland novel that grew popular in the 19th century. Um, these novels were set in the countryside and they presented um, Austrian country life as something idyllic and beautiful. Um, these novels were populated by morally sound people who live in harmony with nature. And um, this idea of nature was often contrasted with um, the, a picture of the city who um, was inhabited by um, morally corrupt uh, people and where um, everything was dirty, basically. So um, these were the two sides that were played against each other. Um, these novels were hugely successful and are still read um, widely. Um, one of the most famous authors for this is uh, Peter Rosecker, who you see here on the left side. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, um, authors came forward who had made a very different experience with life in the Austrian countryside. And um, they wrote about that in the Anti-Heimat-Roman, the anti-homeland uh, novel. Um, those are the, for example, the authors you see here on the right side. We have here Franz Innerhofer, Thomas Bernhardt, or Josef Winkler. Um, Thomas Bernhardt was, of course, not only famous for the Anti-Heimat uh, novel, but also um, for his theater plays and other novels. But those um, authors, they depicted the countryside not anymore as beautiful and idyllic, but um, they uh, found it, in contrast, brutal and violently ruled by rigid social hierarchies. So now we already are at the last period I want to talk about, and that is Austria in context, Austrian literature, and the European Union. Um, here you um, can see uh, the last map of this presentation um, where we see Austria um, and how it is located um, in the European Union. Um, Austria, Austria joined the European Union in 1995 at the end of the century. 
And interestingly enough, the mood at the time had some similarities to where we started at the beginning of the century. Um, texts about catastrophes and the end of the world popped up um, often. Um, I, for example, already mentioned the Children of the Dead by um, Efri Jelinek, but also texts by Christoph Ransmeier or Josef Haslinger dealt with this subject. Um, with the accession um, to the European Union, Austria's author authors focused even more beyond Austria's borders in terms of means of publication um, and networks, but also thematically. Um, you can, for example, notice that at the start of the 21st century, traveling becomes a frequent topic in Austrian novels. Um, lately, even the EU as an institution became the focus um, of an Austrian novel. Um, here we see Robert Menasse's novel, Die Hauptstadt, the capital, um, which is a satirical novel about the EU and um, where the author um, heavily evokes allusions to Musil's Mann ohne Eigenschaften, the man without qualities. Um, something we can um, see or we, we note um, at the beginning of the 21st century is that there seem to have um, developed two sides to Austrian literature. Um, we have, on the one hand, authors that write in the tradition of uh, Sprachkritik and try to find new ways to use language. Um, those are here the authors on the top half. Um, we have here, for example, um, Friederike Mayröcke. Um, Friederike Mayröcke is um, considered to be something like the grand dame of Austrian literature. You can see her here in her office um, that is famous because it is so messy. Um, but Mayröcke is also famous um, for her language experiments um, where, she, um, where she looks after, looks for a way to express her thoughts through typographical innovations, associative writing um, by breaking language and putting it together in a new way. So uh, she uses language as a material. Um, Katrin Rögler and Marlene Strerowitz are also examples um, for um, the tradition of Sprachkritik, but they are more concerned with um, exposing power structures in language. Um, so those are the authors that are concerned with um, Sprachkritik, and uh, this is one side of Austrian literature, and the other side would be um, um, uh, Austrian literature that um, is more concerned with um, storytelling. Um, they are the so-called Neue Erzählerinnen, uh, the new storytellers. And some examples you can see here on the bottom half. Um, we have, for example, uh, Monika Helfer. Um, her remarkable um, autobiographical story about her family was a bestseller in um, 2020. And then we have, for example, Daniel Kielmann, whose fictitious uh, biography of two German mathematicians called Die Vermessung der Welt, or Measuring the World, was an international success in 2005. And here, um, the last picture, we have Thomas Glavinich, who is also very successful with his often genre-inspired novels, for example, um, with The Arbeit der Nacht, or night work, um, where one morning the protagonist discovers that he is apparently the last living thing on the planet. So now, before we come to a short conclusion, um, I'd like to point to one of the most controversial Austrian authors in recent years, um, Peter Handke. Um, Peter Handke, who received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2019, started to write in the 60s. Um, he started with experimental literature and he got very quickly, very famous for his new approach to literature. Um, he also got famous for his radical critique um, of the literary establishment and the unapologetic way he followed his literary ideas. Um, for example, with his novel, Die Hornissen, 
the Hornet um, or his play Publikumsbeschimpfungen, um, which translates to insulting the audience and which does exactly that. Um, in theatre and in prose, he was an innovator that brought many influential ideas into literature and uh, not only in Austria, but um, for many um, texts. Um, so you um, might think this sounds great. So why is he controversial? Um, the controversy stems from Hanke's preoccupation with what was then Yugoslavia, um, which became a dominant issue for him in public statements, as well as in literary texts from the 90s onwards. Um, in his literary texts, he never um, spoke much about the politics in Yugoslavia, but he um, depicted it, it as a, a beautiful place, as a place of longing. In uh, public statements, though, he expressed the opinion that um, especially Serbia was treated unfairly during the Yugoslavian wars, uh, especially by Western politics and media. Um, a statement that drew heavy controversy from the public that considered Serbia responsible, responsible for many war crimes. Um, this controversy follows Hanke up until today, and it also resurfaced when he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, now, especially authors who um, fled uh, the Yugoslavian wars and now live in Austria or in Germany, and pointed out that writing about Yugoslavia has to include writing about the war. Um, leaving it out and writing about landscape, like Handke did, or still does, um, would mean to negate history. So, um, before we come to a short conclusion, I'd like to point uh, to some source material um, for the reading, in case you're interested. We have here the first one is um, Eine kurze Geschichte der Literatur, um, a short story of literature in Austria, which is not short at all and covers um, uh, the time from basically the Middle Ages to the 90s by uh, Winfried Kriegleder. And then we have the two volumes of Bruchlinien. Um, those are lectures by uh, Wendelin Schmidt Dengler, um, who is a quite famous, or who was a quite a famous um, German studies researchers, a researcher. Um, so just if you're interested, he covers the time from 1945 to 2008. So um, now for my conclusion, I will stop the presentation and come back to you. Um, yes. So now we have reached the literary present and the end of the um, of this presentation. So let me just, um, as a conclusion, come back to the questions I asked at the beginning. Um, the first question I asked was, what makes an author Austrian? Um, and I suppose we haven't come closer to answer this one, um, probably because in an age of globalization, it no longer makes sense to define something by a nation. Authors who were not born in Austria like Barbie Markovic or Marko Dinic, who are both from Serbia but write in Austria in German. Um, they are just as much Austrian authors um, as is Maya Hadala, who writes from her experience as part of the Slovenian minority in Austria, or Florian Lepusch, who also is part of the Austrian Slovenian minority, but he writes in uh, Slovenian. Um, Especially those authors who made experience of migration and not belonging bring a new perspective into Austrian literature that can only be beneficial to it, I would argue. Um, and the same goes, of course, for the globalized perspectives of Austrian authors who were born in Austria but choose to live outside the country. Um, like, for example, we just had Peter Hanke, who nowadays lives in Paris or close to Paris. Um, all of those authors contribute to the rich diversity that is Austrian literature today and which maybe should not be defined through their nationality, but through its texts. The second point um, that I promised to come back soon 
uh, come back um, is that Austrian literature is often considered to be overly complicated, way too theoretical, and basically unsellable. Um, this, at least, I think I could um, rebut. Um, maybe um, just one point about the unsellable. Um, the implication of unsellable is, of course, that not only can there no money be made um, from Austrian literature, but that is, uh, that is also not being read by a wider audience. An assumption which many texts and authors proved wrong, like for example, Salton's Bambi or um, Thomas Bernhardt, which are worldwide bestsellers to this day, as is Kehlmann or Glavinich or Helfer. Helfer. Um, and um, they, um, they um, spoke out against this idea. And so at the, at the very end to the idea of Austrian literature being too complicated. Well, while Austrian literature has used some theoretical approaches, um, like all literatures do, um, those were motors to great innovation and ultimately made literature a whole lot more interesting, I would say. So um, I suppose my conclusion is um, why shouldn't um, literature sometimes be complicated. So um, I guess we are now at the end of this tour de force through Austrian literature. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and you took something from it. Um, 